Six of one, half dozen of another. This is the Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com <laughs> is the URL for our site, and you can learn all about us there, including our Tuesday podcast, TFG Unbuttoned. And you'll also learn about our partner, Deep Discount. We're going to be visiting with them uh, later in the podcast here. Tim, are you laughing because of the bakery-themed... We had no, on, I'm, on, I'm laughing because you were, you and I were talking previous, and it, I'm <laughs> laughing about what we were talking about, because that should be the show, the show before the show, which would be... <laughs> You know, probably get a suit or something for the for the tales we tell. But that that really is that stuff people would like to hear, right? The yes, ant, the antics behind the scenes. So Tim does a lot of this with a straight face. Like, so we'll we're, we're, we'll we'll be online and we're prepping to we're just exchanging information or whatever. And then he'll say, "What about this story?" And he'll remind me of a story from the past. He does it all in this very deadpan kind of you know. And then I'm reminded of the characters in the play. And yeah, yeah. It, it it is the show, right? The show right. between before the show. Right, the religious quotes taped to the desk and the hookers the night before. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to corporate America. You might as well say what part it was. Like, you got a call from someone's assistant. Like, you got to come up here and help me change the cushions. Yeah, let me change the cushions. And do you have gloves? There's, <laughs> there's panties and bottles. and I'm not picking it up. By the way, just, just as a, a side note, Do you like, have you gloves? Know, that's the part that gets me the most because, like, w w you have to run out to like the store to buy a pair of like Playtex, like the stuff you use to wash dishes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, uh, uh, the old days, I, actually, I guess, right? Well, not so old because we were actually talking about uh, future podcasts and uh, stories we want to tell, and Tim came up with a a concept for one of uh, a, a short series of behind the scenes, behind the curtains kind of thing on a client we did work with a couple of years ago. And we're, we're, we're basically debating how much can you, <laughs> the first thing Tim said to me was I'm looking into libel laws. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it was essentially we're going to be a primer to say we were out looking, we, we had uh, pitched a piece of business mm -hmm. and uh, we ended up getting it. And then it was like, you know, oh shit! Now what? Mm -hmm. And um, and how you and I kind of need, you know, wound, uh, threaded the needle, I guess, for lack of a better word. And quite frankly, had the owners not been involved, it probably would still be a going concern. Oh and, yeah, and probably would have done probably would have done quite well. But uh, by hook or crook, these people put together the the crazy owners put together an actually perfect team to do yeah. what they wanted to do. But then, typical of this bunch. They couldn't get out of their way. Up. Yep, couldn't yeah. get out of their own way. So that's a story we were going to tell, which I think we will tell. It's just we're trying to figure out what you could say. How much is in public domain and how much is observation and or... Someone once told me, if it's your story, it's your story. Correct. But um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much you can say or not say. We'd have to probably talk to somebody. Right? But you say you listen to these podcasts all the time where people will tell... Um, kind of behind the scenes or insider info about mm -hmm. maybe making of a movie or making of a series or something. And um, I guess if it's not, is any of it, do you think any of it's harmful? Considering the parties that are involved and what's happened over the past couple of years, I don't think if we changed a couple of names and, and the name of the company, we'd be in, I'd think we'd be totally in the clear. <laughs> yeah, I don't me. think anything's harmful because they've harmed themselves. But, um, oh yeah, they were good at that. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, quick, uh, quick little housekeeping bit here. Tim, remember uh, a week, couple weeks ago, your caught my eye was how McDonald's sold ice. Yes, it could, like you could buy a bag of ice at McDonald's. Which I had well, no we idea. A, we got a letter from a guy out west. Um, he said, "Hey guys, you can get a bag of ice at Arby's as well." Really? Give us a little shout out, maybe. So there's your shout out. Arby's also sells <laughs> ice. He said, just started listening to you guys last year. You guys are awesome. The highlight of my morning, showering with the focus group. I wonder if Ooh. that's like a, is that an unbuttoned shower? That's like a, that showering, could, because, yeah, <laughs> getting ready. Maybe Gillette could sponsor that. <laughs> there you go. So Arby's has ice. When was the last time you actually ate at an Arby's? You know, you have to have them around you to do this, right? Yeah, there is an Arby's here in Rehoboth, um, Rehoboth Beach. The um, what, what would you say they're most known for? 
Uh, like a roast beef sandwich. Beef sandwich, okay. Yeah, and also milkshakes, which I was unaware of because my former rowing coach, um, one of his, <laughs> somewhat yeah. morbid, but one of his dying wishes was to have one of their vanilla shakes. And so Brian and I, two days before he died, snuck one in. And uh, the nurse went crazy when he had it. But of course, that was a Saturday. It was dead Monday. So I think he was he enjoyed the shake. But um, <laughs> and it had nothing to do with. I don't think the shake. Did. I don't think the shake killed him. But he he would he had wanted he had wanted it, and uh, so we got him a vanilla shake. But who, who is did the guy? Did he put his name down? Sometimes we get letters and nobody writes their name. Oh yeah, well, his yeah. name is Harry um, Harry I Farrell, like E I F E R L E. I couldn't pronounce that, but he's the president. So out of a, west. Uh, yeah, and he owns a. Um, RV he owns franchise? a franchise. Yeah, oh, and cool. so. Um, he said, by the way, what does it take for a guy to get socks? Exactly what he just did. So I sent him a note and said, hey. I wonder what state he's in. Maybe we'll stop in. Do you know, we'll I do think that I looked at this, and if I'm not mistaken, it might have been Missouri. Does that sound okay. right to you? Maybe he's near Merrimack Caverns. Oh, God. Remember Merrimack <laughs> Caverns. One way. That was a highlight of a trip that... Could never replicate it again. Yeah, you can't replicate that trip Well, again. you could never replicate that because that's yeah. just, you know... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Arby's. Okay, well, we'll have to... Uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad he's a new listener. Welcome. And uh, I'm sure we have some new listeners along the way. And uh, it's always good to welcome people to the show. And you can find out all of our information at focusgroupradio.com. Right, John? You can find all of our media house there, which quite a few shows I went back and was oh my looking God, for Tim. an old one. Well, we've been doing this for 16 years. Now, yeah. not all our serious <laughs> shows are there, but since we did podcasting since 2016, they're all there. By the way, our listener that uh, sent us the thing about Arby's is uh, Michigan. Oh, Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Well, I may be going out there. Really? I don't know. Yeah. Depends on where in Michigan it is. Let me go see the what comrade. What are you doing in Michigan? I don't know. We'll drive out and see the comrade this okay. time. <laughs> we'll go, we'll, and we'll get a bag of ice. A friend of mine opened up an organic farm out there that I went to college with, one of my rowing buddies. And uh, we've been going back and forth. But I, I wouldn't mind go seeing his farm, although he's got a lot of rules about coming onto an organic farm, about what you can bring and not bring and how you operate. So I don't know if you oh and I might not get it. Yeah, we may get kicked out. But I, it could be a cool trip, right? Yeah. Yeah, but he, he was left this land and uh, started this very cool organic uh, So organic he's farm. trying to use no chemical fertilizers. They want to be careful about what comes out of the property. Right, don't cutting anything down, yeah. right, and, and uh, making sure kind of nature does its thing. And uh, apparently quite successful. He's a brilliant guy. He he ended up not graduating from Marietta. He ended up leaving. And he was one of those those people you meet along the way that was probably a renaissance man, way ahead of his time. And um, just as a very smart, smart, bright guy. But we've kept in contact. Anyway, you opened this. this uh, I'm intrigued. You have, to, you have to keep me in the loop on that yeah. one. That is really cool. Yeah, we'll stop by and then we'll go see the comrade. The, <laughs> I haven't seen comrade in forever and I would love to see her. And I gave her that nickname on a when she was look at my new Prada shoes. Well, that's when she told us she was basically a socialist or a communist. Yeah, and she was, and, and we're sitting on a yacht in St. Bart, by the way. <laughs> Drinking well, there was, champagne. Well, there was and a she war going up her foot. Right, a war going on, and the French Navy was protecting you know St. Bart, and uh, telling us how she you know was all for the people and down with the people and everything. And meanwhile, she'd spent the whole day looking for this pair of Prada sandals, and that's when you yeah. said, "Nice shoes, she puts comrade." Her foot. <laughs> And she, you, you know, the best part was she credit, laughed harder. She laughed harder than anyone else because after she, she had just stop. given us the lecture about how yeah. she was a communist and socialist and all these other things. But that's re- that's the reason she's so fantastic, right? It's because she could <laughs> she could take a joke like nice that. Nice of and... shoes, comrade. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. It was almost like the joke wrote itself. <laughs> all right. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Bennett, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Speaking of communists, um, <laughs> Costco. I was surprised this came across my uh, came across my desk feed? There, my feed, and Costco is selling um, gold bars, and, or they sold gold bars, and now they're selling silver coins. Did you know this? Because you and I are I Costco s- shoppers. I saw this, and I couldn't. F- 
figure out what aisle this would be in, but anyway. I couldn't either. So it's at Costco, which has, you know, locked up certainly the $1.50 hot dog soda loyalist. Do you get the hot dog, by the way, for $1.50? It's the best deal We used to always get it. Now, Bob has not been in a while, and that was his thing. If he went, he yeah. you do not go by the food court without the $1.50 hot dog. That was. The, and you can was... ask for sauerkraut. They don't advertise it, but sauerkraut's free. You just have to say, I'd like sauerkraut. And they go in this okay. little thing, and they pull out See, sauerkraut. you learn something every, new on the, every, new, every day on the focus group. But they said they've recently started selling silver coins for the first time according to their finance chief or according to their finance chief uh, this story came from cnn the company costco is selling 25 count tubes of one ounce canada maple leaf silver coins oh they're selling them online they said for 675 dollars so the front of the coin features a matri- uh, features a maple leaf and king charles iii is on the back the coins are non-refundable and members can purchase a maximum of five it says Costco is trying to replicate its recent success with gold bars. It began selling $2,000 gold bars online in September and sold a hundred million dollars worth in the last mm. quarter alone. Can you imagine a hundred million dollars worth, worth of gold bars? Okay. Yeah. They said Costco's move is more about marketing than increasing sales. It said, uh, after all, not many people are going to be stashing these gold bars away at home, but they said, its idea for selling precious metals was to reinforce its treasure hunt, in quotes, brand image where it peppers its stores with unexpected, limited time items to keep shoppers coming back. So I started thinking, well, what, you know, what are you, the Trader Joe's or the Marshalls of <laughs> right? Trader Joe's, the Marshalls of Food, as we used to call them. If you, don't, if you see something at Trader Joe's, get it, because you're not going to get it again. be back. It's the Marshalls of Food. I guess that's where Costco's going. This says we want to try to create an attitude that if you see it, you ought to buy it because chances are you ain't going to get it next time, according to Costco's founder uh, when they interviewed him. The treasure hunt aspect, uh, it's a treasure hunt aspect that we want to create here. We constantly buy stuff and intentionally run out of it from time to time to keep people uh, coming back for more. So this was really about um, coming back novelty. and trying to find It's a novelty, novelty item. Which yeah. reminds me also of, you know, they were doing... Um, I want to do, I haven't been to Costco in a while, but they've got these pineapple spears that everybody's talking about. So these Mm. jars, it's in, um, so they're pineapple and they're in this uh, kind of coconut syrup. And people just, they've they've been all over social media and people are trying to find them and they're just, people say they're unbelievable. And uh, there's also these butter cakes from Rehoboth that um, they have at the Costco in Delaware. They might have near you, Frankie's and Louie's butter cakes. Look for those too. But, um, so they just started selling at Costco. They said during the pandemic, Costco has grown tremendously. Yeah. That many people had signed on to uh, to become members of the wholesale club and uh, to stock up on groceries and household staples. Like, remember, pa- remember you can get paper towels or toilet paper? And uh, so they said that they're at an all-time high in terms of memberships and profits. So there you go, Costco. Go get your gold and silver. I uh, So here's the thing, or here's what I'm thinking about. What utility does a silver coin or a gold bar have if, for example, there's no electricity um, or we're in a, like, I always think of these precious metal buys as some kind of dystopic hedge if things go off the cliff, like bartering and like, what, you know what I'm getting at? Like, what do you do with it? If it increases in value, do you sell it? You know, I don't even know how you do that. Well, it's a novelty thing, right? It reminds me of when, and I think you had the same situation with your grandparents. There was a there was a neighbor that always gave my brother and I a silver dollar. We'd had like yes, at our birthdays. Right. Yeah. I still have them. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't. I guess you could spend them. I could take them into the bank. I guess, and the bank would cash them in. Actually, if you save them, you might want to look online to look for the. Some of them are actually worth a lot more than you suspect really? because they were they were minted at a time when they put more more almost one hundred percent silver in. <laughs> and there are some. Uh, there's a, a couple of. Was it the Kennedy half? Right, the half dollar. dollars. And I think Eisenhower was on the silver dollar, if I'm right. You're, ex- you're exactly right, yeah. And some of them, based on the mint or the year they came out, are actually collector's items for, uh, who who collects, new, new, pneumologists? Is that a coin collector? No, oh, I don't know. You, you, you're way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> coin yeah, well, collector. <laughs> maybe with that, maybe I'm getting ready. Maybe I'm Coin confusing collector. with a stamp collector, but it's the same thing. There, there are some mintings, like there's this famous stamp postage stamp of an air it's called the jerry something it's an upside down plane or something and they they're so rare that when one pops up it's worth 
you know, tons of money. And you're like, it's a stamp, but you know, yeah. same with the coin. All right. So you're saying this is a play for, well, I think it's a novelty thing, right? If you gave somebody this, um, now, not that you'd give a $2,000 gift, but you gave somebody this, um, you know, one of these coins, it's probably worth, I don't know if there's five, I don't know how much it would be worth one coin of the, of the tube. But if you gave them out as, as a gift or you gave, uh, gave it to somebody as knowing it's worth $2,000, whether they cashed it in or not or kept it, I would guess you'd keep it as a novelty, right? You mm -hmm. put it on your yeah. table. And whether and that's the thing, whether you use these things or not. So then because I thought the same thing about these silver dollars. I came when I was moving, I came across this box with them and there's probably five or six in there. And Just then I had some yeah. some old two dollar bills too. Classics. Yeah. But I thought, what am I gonna you know, I'm not gonna spend them, but also is it eh. there is an app, I guess you can go on and and um and check to see what things are worth. So, so maybe I'll do that. But. I would check that out because my granddad, I'm Tim, I have exactly six silver dollars and about eight halves. And it was from my grandfather. It was the same thing. And yeah, so I checked it out one day because I, I had read somewhere that one of these Eisenhower silver dollars is worth, I was like, maybe I have that. <laughs> well, later on, we're going to talk about something that I did have that I'm mad that I got rid of at my yard sale, but it'll, it'll be during our business birthday. Ah, Okay. Well, what caught my eye, I'm back in a history, you know, I have a couple caught my eyes these past couple of weeks that have dealt with like historic things. This one caught my eye because it, well, it's Hadrian's Wall, which is in England, has been declared a historic LGBTQ landmark, which huh. is interesting because I don't associate, I didn't associate before I knew this, before I read this article, like something like an archaeological thing like Hadrian's Wall with anything LGBTQ, but... England's heritage, English heritage has recognized the wall as a landmark linked to England's queer history. The Romans constructed the stone wall during the second century of the Common Era, approximately 1900 years ago. So Emperor Hadrian pushed the boundaries of the Roman Empire far, far north. And Hadrian's wall was the demarcation line for how far the Roman Empire extended into the then, you know, they, I don't think they called it Britain, but maybe they did. But it's about 73 miles, spanning 73 miles at its completion. The wall once traveled the entire width of what is now northern England. It is considered to be one of the best preserved artifacts from that time period. Um, English Heritage, the charity that manages over 400 of these historic monuments in the country, wrote about the landmark significance in a recent email to its membership. And the organization said that Hadrian's Wall is linked to England's queer history through the emperor's well-documented history of gay relationships. Now, this is the thing that surprised me. So Hadrian had several male lovers while he was married to his wife, his wife Sabina. The most prominent one was Antinus, a younger Greek man who accompanied the emperor oh. on his tours of expansive Roman territories. When Antinus died at the age of 20 by drowning in the River Nile, so he died in Egypt, Hadrian was so heartbroken that he remained in mourning for years, filling his palace with statues that resembled his lost lover, naming stars and flowers after him, and f holding festivals and athletic games in his honor. <laughs> um, after his death, the emperor also elevated his late lover to the status of a god, erecting temples to him throughout the empire. He also established the city of and Antonopolis in his honor. Same-sex relationships were common in ancient Rome, but National Museum's Liverpool still hails Hadrian and Antinus as the most famous homosexual couple in Roman history. So if you're watching on YouTube, there's a picture of a segment of the wall. Next to it is a picture of the Emperor Hadrian. And then inset there, I've there's a marble statue of Antinus, who every statue I looked at, every representation, he looked like he was probably Probably a hot guy. <laughs> I bet his but, nickname was in tight ass. <laughs> Look at him with that locky hair. And, and he was you know, Greek. So um, yeah. this one was just surprising to me um, that they would do this. And uh, I think it's really cool, actually. Well, what do they have to but, do? There's no TV or anything. No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that they made Hadrian's oh, Wall LGBTQ plus landmark, yeah. I thought, you know, I often wonder about a lot of these things where people have these these relationships. I thought, what else were they doing? <laughs> well, if you're the emperor, you're basically in a tent, right? You know, and people are coming and reporting coming to, to you. Coming to see you. What do you want to eat today? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Have Antinous go down and, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, the thing, I, it just says to me, this little historical d dive says to me that, um, you know, same-sex relationships have been in our, our, our uh, human race since the dawn of time. 
whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, that, that that's that's really like putting blinders on a horse or taking them off because it exists. It's real. And the fact that the Romans were so um, kind of cool with it, and so are the Greeks. The ancient Greeks, you know, there's all these stories about how um, in, in the Greek military they would often take male lovers when they were, at, you know, away from and battled, and they'd come home to their wives and kids. I mean, it was, it was a very, very different period, right? I guess they weren't so uptight. I mean, for God's sakes, we're still trying to get over Rock Hudson from the 50s. <laughs> that, you know, they don't want to talk about it. Hey, so. speaking of which, there was an article that crossed my radar about um, Armistead Maupin, you know, yes. author of Tales of the City. Apparently, he he was uh, he was sexually involved with uh, Rock Hudson for a little while. Yes, if he met him at a pool party. If you go, That's if right. you look at if you look at, um, there's actually a documentary out on one of the streamers somewhere about um, Rock Hudson and uh, Hollywood's best well known secret about Rock Hudson and about uh, all the men that he had along the way. <laughs> and uh, yes, Mopin was one of them. And he talked about how intimidated he was. Apparently Rock was pretty well endowed. Mm. This this particular article, uh, Armistead Malpin talked about how uh, Rock Hudson also liked poppers. Yes. And had a special little case made for them, a little way he carried them around. And yeah, I... I this was all, it wasn't news to me about Rock Hudson, but it was news to me about Armistead Malpin. Yeah, no, the, the, uh, you'll like the documentary. It, it's pretty quick. It's, it's a little over an hour. And, oh, perfect. Uh, I'm going to look this yeah, up. Totally. Yeah, look it up. I, I, I should know the name, but it's something like Heaven something, or I don't know. I forget the exact name of it, but. Well, you know, in our modern day of search, if I put in Rock Hudson documentary, you know something's going to come up. Yeah. And if any of the words you just said, if I see them, I'll be like, that's the one he's talking about. Different than the, different than no one's really done a, other than the movie, no one's really done anything about Liberace, right? I mean, that was another well-known secret. Quite well-known. Oh, except, but, don't you think the movie, didn't you rewatch Behind the Candelabra? I um, did. I just rewatched it recently, too. And you said it held up. Yeah, and I, you know, I just laughed. I mean, when he comes out in that LeMay caftan, sorry, I'm with so the informal. With the wig on. <laughs> sorry, I'm so informal. Informal. <laughs> with the gold the LeMay rants. caftan. <laughs> but it, it um, but again, just how they never really, he never, Liberace never, he had sh it was shame, shameful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I'm sure it, it ate him up inside. So it's, uh, and same yeah, with it's what he lived, time period, it's what, he, they, it's what they lived with. It's yeah. not great, but it's what they did. Yep. All right. As uh, many of you know, our partner here on the Focus Group is Deep Discount. We would like you to visit their site by going to ours, focusgroupradio.com, and clicking on the Deep Discount logo, which is a shark called Sharky. Arr, Sharky hasn't been around in a while. Um, before I start, quick little note uh, that I found in the, um, I think it was Business Insider, that Best Buy, you know, big store Best Buy is disc they're no longer going to carry any physical media no more CD no more DVDs Blu-rays 4K oh, really? <clears throat> and it just says to me if you like something buy it because you could always pop it in your player like you know we do it all the time and they right. don't things are not always on a streaming thing so um this month we have a spring-wide Shark Madness sale. Everything at Deep Discount is on sale. They already have great prices, but you can pick up actual vinyl records, books, fan things, electronics, games. And, of course, Tim and I often uh, most exclusively talk about um, movies, TVs, and sometimes uh, music. So, Mr. Bennett, what did you pick out of the spring sale this week? So I um, I picked an oldie but goodie. It was uh, best, <laughs> best in show. I went to – so I, I, when I went to Deep Discount, I clicked on – the most popular or trending movies and this one popped up probably because of jennifer coolidge she's in it which um people <laughs> people know from um she has such a great character in this movie right yeah and 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 uh, of course uh christopher guest parker posey fred Keating, eugene levy yeah. eugene levy and and people from uh schitt's creek so there's some of that sort of sensibility or, or um humor in it the great Catherine o'hara right yep so it's it's uh it's about a dog show called the Mayflower Dog Show, which is a kind of a riff on the the Philadelphia, <laughs> the Philadelphia Dog Show. But so it's uh the tension is palpable, the excitement is mounting, and the heady scent of competitions in the air. As hundreds of eager contestants across America prepare to take part in one of the greatest events of their lives, the Mayflower Dog Show. And so it's all these characters, of course, and. Uh, there's the the gay couple, the straight. I mean, it's it's everything under the sun that are going to be participating in this dog show. And it's just that kind of very tongue in cheek, 
what I find very um, kind of smart, funny, funny. Oh, humor. Tim, when you sent this over, I I just smiled because I can actually we, we can remember whole scenes from this movie, sections of dialogue. Busy Bee, Parker Posey, <laughs> when they lose that dog's little toy. <laughs> we need the Busy Bee. I, I love when Jennifer Coolidge sitting there and goes. She's she's you know very in her thirties and the husband's in his nineties or whatever and she's like we have in a, a wheelchair lot in common yeah. right we have a lot in common both like soup. <laughs> <laughs> I remember busting out laughing in the theater when I and people are looking. It's Do only you know, ninety um, minutes long. It's Christopher uh, Guest actually encouraged this the the cast to sometimes just go off script and in fact sometimes the script line would say ad lib. So <laughs> it's hard to say when they did this, but I I mean. Come on, that's brilliant, right? Like we yeah. have a lot in common. Both, both like, like so. soup. It uh, originally came out uh, in 2000, and then it's come out on DVD and Blu-ray in 2013. Uh, you can pick it up for under fifteen dollars on Blu-ray and a little under eleven dollars on DVD. Yeah, and you might as well, if it's a spring sale, if you get Best in Show, you might as well get Waiting for Guffman in a Mighty Wind. Exactly. You might as well get the yeah bookend it right. Yeah. I picked something from the uh, Deep Discount Top 100, which I think is what you kind of did too. And I was intrigued by it because I've actually heard about this movie a couple times, but never have seen it. It stars Edward G. Robinson, and uh, it's a film noir that was uh, made in 1945, and it's called Scarlet Street. It has an interesting history. Um, so it's, uh, it's a 1945 film. And uh, the screenplay concerns two criminals who take advantage of a middle-aged painter who is uh, actually uh, Edward G. Robinson in order to steal his artwork. The the film is based on the French novel called La Chienne, which literally translates to the bitch (laughs) or the dog, right? The bit. And uh, which had been previously dramatized on stage. Um, When the movie came out, it was actually banned. Uh, Local authorities in New York, Milwaukee, and Atlanta banned the Scarlet Street uh, screenings in early 1946 because of its dark plot and themes. In other words, these two people taking advantage of Edward G. Robinson, this struggling artist, an un- wow. unhappy, married, aspiring painter. So I just, it's, it pops up a lot in, in uh, film critics often talk about this period of time in certain movies, and Scarlet Street pops up, and I've never seen it, so I want to get it. And this edition is a 4K HD Ultra HD, uh, they call it a steel box edition. So there's a lot of great little extras in there, and it probably looks great. You know, I love watching black and white movies, anyways, especially if they've been, tre- you know, restored and they just right. sparkle. So that was my pick, and we do have a new release this week, uh, one that I would actually like to see because I think we all know the original film uh, that starred Whoopi Goldberg, and this is the color purple, the 2023 version. Um, a story of love and resilience. The color of purple is a decades spanning tale of one woman's journey to independence. Seely faces many hardships in her life, but ultimately finds extraordinary strength and hope in the unbreakable bonds of sisterhood. Now, am I correct in my assumption that this is actually closer to being a musical? Because I know there are musical numbers in here. Have you heard about this? I haven't heard much about it, but I was curious because like you, the original color purple was not that long ago. No. Well, right. Tim, I got to tell you, it's it's a while. Is it? <laughs> yeah, it's it goes back, yeah. Because I was trying to figure that, and I thought it, it seemed awful early to do, and I wondered why in some cases they do, you, you know, they do remake? another a remake. An update yeah, or a refresh. An update yeah. and a refresh. So, but I think you're right. There's a number of... Uh, a number of musical numbers from what I hear. So maybe maybe it does have a more musical score. I don't know. So we'll have to we'll have to check that out. So it is a new release then from uh, from Deep Discount. So as John mentioned earlier, be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com. There's a uh, Shark Madness sale going on, site-wide sale at Deep Discount. And uh, you can find lots of media there that um, will keep you busy for, for quite some time. I had picked this week Best in Show, which is an old <laughs> classic. That gets a thumbs up. <laughs> John had picked something that intrigues me, Scarlet, Scarlet Street, which originally came out in 1945 in black and white. So I, And the fact that it was banned by a number of cities even makes it more intriguing to me. So I think Scarlet Street would be certainly something to add to your collection. And then the new release is the updated uh, The Color Purple. So I uh, just released there at Deep Discount. So again, be sure to go to focus, focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo and start shopping away and we appreciate their support of us on the show and your support of them 
We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got our business birthday and a shop talk about shopping. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Welcome back to the focus group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for everything you need to know about us including our Tuesday podcast, TFGM Button. And you'll learn about our partners there, too. We just visited with one deep discount. You could get to them by going to our site and clicking on the deep discount logo. So, Mr. Bennett, without further ado, the only show that does this, The Business Birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but The Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So uh, we had a couple. Well, we had several options today. Today's March 11th, and... um, the first one I, I had thought of doing, and then I had stumbled across the one that we're going to do. But the first one was a guy named David Cummings. Do you know him? Do you know that name? Well, I know E.E. E. Cummings, the author. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> what did David da- do? <laughs> David Cummings is the world's oldest porn star. <laughs> oh, so. well, that, Tim, that le- legitimately to me is a business birthday, but I know we've... So we'll have to, we'll have to figure that. Maybe next time we do March 11th in the year 20, you know, 33... We'll, uh, we'll, we'll cover him. But um, I did pick instead somebody who's 63 years old today. Uh, the official uh, date of debut or birthday is Ken, the Ken doll. <laughs> this, I love this. <clears throat> I didn't so, know it had a whole name. I didn't know it had, had a name. I had no idea either. The real name or the name of the Ken doll, which uh, was released or appeared uh, today, 63 years ago, on March 11th, 1961, is Kenneth Sean Ken Carson Jr. <laughs> Someone actually came up with that. That's his name, right? He's a counterpart to Barbie, and uh, who was introduced two years earlier. So similar to Barbie, Ken is from Willows, Wisconsin. I didn't know they were from a place. They're from Willows, Wisconsin. Uh, he had a fashionable line of clothing and accessories. And the, the original debut, if you're looking at the, um, the pictures, it actually came out with a swimsuit. He had over 40 occupations in his life. It's quite, quite a uh, polymath. He, um, he met Barbie on the set of a TV commercial and was her boyfriend until 2018. And now they've just been platonic friends. They decided to take a break, like a lot of celebrity couples do. <laughs> so he's, he's been everything from an astronaut to a chef to a pilot to a doctor, a military. Uh, he was in the military, lifeguard, vet, doctor, uh, as I said, architect, teacher, teacher, a number of different occupations. Um, when he was introduced in 61, he, is, he was named after a real person named Kenneth Handler. So Kenneth Handler was the son of Barbie creator and inventor Ruth Handler. And Barbie was the name of her daughter, and Kenneth was the name of her son. So that's how Barbie and Ken got their names. Uh, the real Ken Handler, who, who Ken was modeled after, died of a brain tumor in 1994, and uh, they said when he when uh, Ken debuted, he only had straight arms that did not bend, and his head could only turn left and right, and his hair was made of felt. And uh, so, if you get some of these older Kens, they call it the flocked-haired Ken. But it was replaced with plastic or molded hairstyle because the creator started to realize after a few years that the hair would fall out on Ken as he got older. But that happens; your hair falls out when you get older. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Um, he had, and so when they updated him, he, they featured a dimpled smile. He had then had a head that could swivel, some bent arms, a more muscular physique, some jewelry, underwear, also. And uh, they said that the appearance of him, his muscular appearance. This Ruth was quite a gal. I'd like to meet her. Ruth said that his appearance resembled that of her husband. I guess her husband was a looker. Yeah, exactly. And played tennis and had a tuxedo. And, and everything. So they said, um, so they, as I said, they decided they were going to spend some time apart with the, with the romance. But then they revamped the Ken doll. He was revamped in 2006. 
And they thought, even though he and Barbie were platonic, that maybe they should get together again in 2011 around Valentine's Day. So there was an introduction of him and also a Ken doll in Japan, which was, was the first time that there was a Japanese version in 2011. In 2021, they announced 15 new looks for Ken, which included different skin tones, body shapes, and hairstyles. Um, they said the one issue that uh, they did have, however, is that Ken was certainly, and this was in reference to Barbie also, that the proportions were unrealistic. Mm. And that the chest, if the chest was real, it would be 27.5% larger of a representative human male chest. They said the unrealistic proportions also centered around his lack of genitalia. I uh, that, remember that there was just like a flat nothing yeah. down there, right? They, they thought he might, you know, might have something. The um, Barbie and Ken's last names came from, of all places, their ad agency, which was named Carson Roberts. So <laughs> that's how they got the uh, the name for um, for Carson as the last name for Barbie and Ken from Carson, the ad agency. And then they said that over the years, there were also, and this is where I was talking about earlier, about uh, having things of value. There are a couple of other um, t types of, of uh, Ken dolls that had come out, two in particular that are quite quite collector's items. One in 1993 mm -hmm. was the Air Airing Magic Ken, which um, resembled a lot of the fashions and accessories worn by segments of the, of the gay population. For instance, he had a cock ring around his neck, remember? And the purple it was vest. supposed to be an earring, but yes, well, it was, yeah. it, it, the nickname was Cochrane Ken, right? Right. And so I had two of them perfect in box and sold them at my yard sale in Glenside. You did because not. You somebody did not. told me they weren't worth anything. They are not. What'd you get for them? Oh, probably three, five dollars, right? So uh, I went on eBay and I just looked. They're going for three, four hundred dollars. Yes. I bought them for box, like, right? oh my God, I'm so angry. I called Matt. I yelled. I said, you told me these weren't worth anything. He, oh, well, that's what he said. Well, not oh, well. <laughs> Wait, I could, you know, knowing him, I, oh, well. <laughs> I said, you owe me. You know, these were the, he goes, well, it depends <laughs> who's going to pay for it. I said, I just looked at some, you know, you can go on eBay and see what they've actually sold for. And it was, you know, 145 You mean you did this search where you could look for what the completed sale what was. What the completed yeah. sales were, yeah. And there's also, there was a Sugar Daddy Ken in 2009 um, as part of their Palm Beach line, and everybody got upset about it because it was a Sugar very sick, Daddy Ken. I Sugar never Daddy knew that Ken existed. Yes, it was aimed for adult collectors. The line officially debuted the spring of 2010. The line proved to be controversial because of Ken's suggestive sounding name. The doll had a more mature appearance and came with a West Highland Terrier puppy. <laughs> so Mattel decided that, guess what, John? The puppy's name was Sugar. So this was Sugar's Daddy. That was the way they got out of the. Uh, got That's out of a PR the, threading a needle, right? That ad agency, they're paying them well. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden, oh no, no, you you misread this. It wasn't sh you you're, you're mis you know misinterpreting Sugar Daddy. The, the little dog's name Sugar. He's Sugar's yeah, daddy. daddy. Yeah. So happy birthday, Ken. Sixty three years old today. March Good 11. one. And Tim, I got to tell you something about, uh, you know. Those MIB, those mitten box dolls, your your gut told you you were sitting on something worth more than three bucks, right? I thought so. I, I remember I got the phone call from Marianne. I, we were living in Chicago, this is 1993, and Marianne said, oh my God, the, uh, the Walgreens in Chicago just got a whole shipment of these gay Ken dolls. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, they're like $4.99. So Steve, Dilworth, all we ran up there and bought these dolls. And... Um, and then, what am I going to do with this? So I carted them around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I moved, I had this whole box of these dolls. I had some Lucy dolls, too, and uh, in box. And um, Matt was helping me put the sale together, as Richard and everybody else. And I said, oh, these are going to be worth... Nah, not worth anything. <laughs> now, Matt's usually pretty good about that stuff. Matt usually does look things up. He apparently has some Calvin Klein Barbie that's worth a thousand something dollars in box. Anyway... I'm mad about earring magic, Ken. <laughs> you heard your first, folks. I'm mad about earring. <laughs> so that magic earring, Ken. <laughs> I'm ready. You had two of them. I had two of them. I never even took them out of the box. I mean, at the low end, even if it got three hundred a piece. If they got fifty bucks, I'd have been happy a piece. I'd have sold them both yeah. for a hundred. I know yeah. I didn't get it at the yard sale. <laughs> I was okay. I was selling restoration hardware mirrors for fifteen dollars, and people were still trying to get me down. 
and still trying to buy a vacuum that you mm-hmm. were still that trying to you put still in my own. bathroom, taking things out of my bathroom. Is this for sale? And that's a mop. No, <laughs> I'm not selling my mop. <laughs> that's like when Bob did this really classy uh, yard sale up oh, at our house. Luck. I mean, it was they were people wanted to buy the rack the clothing was hanging yeah. on or the step ladder. Like you were like, no, the, everything was far more valuable than that. I told you I had two chairs that were broken, two desk yep. chairs that were thrown in the trash, literally in the backyard of the house in a pile of trash. Someone and guy them. comes out with both of them. How much for these? I said, 10 bucks each. I'll oh, take them. <laughs> God almighty. <laughs> broken Tim, chairs with it? no arms. Do you remember the acronym TNAFT? TNA. There's no accounting for taste. Oh, I think we got that out of the preppy the handbook. Preppy handbook, possibly. yes. Yeah. Lisa Burma. TNAFT. All right, folks, moving along, we have a shop talk for you today, and our shop talk is called uh, The Six-in-One Method to Grocery Shopping. Um, In a nutshell, there are a couple TikToks online, and people talk about grocery, different methods of going to the grocery store. Perhaps you've heard of just going around the edge of the store, which would hit produce, uh, protein, and, and, and stay away from the aisles, which is usually packaged and processed food. But in this case... Chef Will Coleman put together something called the six to one grocery shopping method here. It works like this. And this is what Tim and I are going to discuss because I'm still trying to puzzle about how I would actually do this. Shoppers purchase six vegetable items, five fruits, four protein sources, three starches, two sauces or spreads, and one item just for fun. The system simplified shopping reduces waste and saves money. I'm thinking that those are all nice things it does, but from a health standpoint, this guarantees you're getting your your correct and proper servings of fruits, vegetables, and good quality protein. So, um, but putting this into practice, though, like, did you think about this, Tim? How would you go about this? Well, I, I, I yeah, you're going the same place I did because I thought, okay, if, as you said, it's it's going to save time. It, it will eliminate food waste. A lot of times you'll buy stuff and maybe you don't use it and it gets it gets thrown away because you have too much lettuce or something. And uh, and then they said it simplifies simplifies the math, meaning that you're just going to buy these things and that's it. And so I tried to figure it out because they, they had said, you know, they gave some examples that if you had purchased, um, for instance, say you had mushrooms and bacon and... Uh, well, mushrooms Some, count as a veggie. Bacon would be a protein. Yeah, a right? protein, and then you could just simply look up, or you know, what what recipes could I make with bacon and mushrooms? So, if you bought those two things, for instance, and you're at the end of your week, it would give you recipes on what you could make or what you could do in terms of the the sauces and uh, and using the food. And I was trying to figure out, like you though, I I just went shopping at Aldi and I I bought oranges, lemons lettuce cucumbers some broccoli i did buy tomatoes avocados but i didn't buy any protein i had bought some cheese but Uh, i thought if i tried doing this i I don't know so i guess you would get four proteins and then i guess i could have taken and maybe i could have done a chicken stir fry i could have done maybe a hamburger with mushroom i I, you know make so and this is i i think you just gave like I'm listening to everything on your list and I thought, okay, he did this, he did this. Like I'm, I'm actually filling in my brain, the columns out and you're, you, you came close on a lot. The woman who wrote this piece said, you know, when she was doing it, she was kind of intimidated. But then I realized as she says in here, like she said, you know, once she got into the groove of it, you know, a garlic is a vegetable, onions, a vegetable, right? right. So if you buy garlic, clove and onions, but I would never say garlic's a vegetable. Like you don't eat garlic, right? You put I agree garlic with you. in as I, a spice, right? I, I think of it as a cooking accessory, yeah. like something you have to have in the kitchen. You know, she went down, and when she got to fruits, uh, five fruit things, she did bananas, lemons, and she put avocado as a fruit. Okay. Yeah. She grabbed some grape tomatoes and some frozen raspberries, at, and she said, yes, frozen and canned foods do count. I had olive oil on hand, but I, to- I, but I totally would have snuck it into this category if I needed it. She's cheating, in other words. Like, I don't. Do you do you put olive oil as a fruit? No. See, I, I would have. When I looked at that list, I thought, okay, lemons, for instance, to me, yes, it's a fruit, but it's usually you're using. We it. don't eat them. Like we you're put them eating. as a garnish. Yeah. yeah. You'd eat an orange, and I'd eat a yeah. lemon. So I would. An avocado to me is a vegetable. Um, so it wouldn't for me count as a fruit. And same with tomatoes. I know they call tomatoes fruits, but to me, that's a vegetable. 
So I would have, um, but yeah, I guess you could have bought bananas, apples, oranges, uh, the frozen raspberries. And I think she, and if, if you have one of those like fr- fruit ninjas or one of those like mixers that do like, you know, smoothies for you, frozen fruit is the best for those. You just dump it in, mix it and you're, and you have a great smoothie. Then she put down here, she said, I admit to some angst about the four proteins. I yeah, needed this one milk. was another one shock to me. She, yeah. I needed milk, but did that count? I would say it sort of does. Should I get dried beans or just nuts since that's easier? In the end, I left with bacon, totally protein. Tofu, source of protein. Cashews, yes, but they're also high in fat and carbohydrates. I'm not sure I would put nuts in that category. And frozen shrimp I would definitely put into the... Me, I would have gotten maybe chicken tenders, frozen shrimp, Canadian bacon, you know, and and ground turkey or something like. That. I think of right. the proteins like that. Is that That's how you thought I of do. that? Yeah, because you could add that to a dish, whether it's rice right. or whether it's lettuce or something. What the hell are you gonna do with cashews? Um, <laughs> you know, you'll eat them. You're gonna put them next to the the magic ear in Ken doll, <laughs> right? But I'm not gonna have a handful of cashews and a piece of chicken. Yeah. you know. So I don't substitute like that now. Yeah, and then the three starches, she grabbed cereal for the kids, understandable, and then pasta and rice. So that makes sense. That made sense mm-hmm. to me. You can stretch that stuff out. And then the sauces, though, was another one that was peculiar to me. She said she got a, um, a bruschetta sauce and a crunchy chili onion oil. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't quite know what I would do with that. I don't I mean, like a yeah, lot I'm of hot sure. spicy. I guess she cooks with it, you know. And then she said, that at the lens, she said, one, choosing one fun thing was hard, but buying only a single treat made it feel extra special. So she picked um, pecan kringle. Have you ever had that? Is that from Trader Joe's? Yeah, it's like crack cocaine. Have you had it? It's unbelievable. No, and she said it tasted like a fancy Pop-Tart. It was nostalgic and delicious. And Pop-Tarts, I think, are sort of like crack cocaine. <laughs> so it's either, it's, so it's in the, so you know where the breads are at, at um, yeah. Trader Joe's, but they usually have uh, sometimes a center like a center cap stand and they're they're like the size of a small pizza but they're in these this white um they're, I, be, I believe it's actually from denmark it's a white wrapper with blue and red writing on it and matt turned me on to it because he's been buying it um and it's great for breakfast great as a dessert it's really quite you'll love it it's it's quite good do we need to try this as a um, an experiment, the six to one method? I, I mean, think we by should the next way, time you go shopping and see what you, and then just say what you bought on your list. Be, but the other thing they do say though, right, is they said if you don't have to, because she said she saved. It looked like she saved about seventy dollars by shopping this way versus her usual shop. I could buy that, yeah. And um, but she said, or if you just have, you know, if you have a bigger family, so you have more than one or two people, um, obviously you're going to have to buy more because you have a larger household. And then what else did she say? She said that if you had, um, if you weren't so concerned about money, um, you can load up on other things. Like yes. for instance, I bought what did I? I bought these some things the other day that I wouldn't normally buy. I had to buy salt. Um, I yeah. had to buy butter. You know, I'm sure you never have staples. to buy aluminum foil. You have a roll that goes back like what oh three God, decades from, from Costco in in, uh, in Oregon back from <laughs> 1990. It's still big, still going. Mm-hmm. I always laugh about that with Bob. I'm like, Tim's been dragging that aluminum foil around the United <laughs> that and States. I had a thing of parsley until someone told me spices went bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's last I think century. this is a it's a clever idea, um, but you know. And by the, next the way, next time you uh, shop, I want you to try it and then write. I'm going to try six to one. Yeah, write down hey, you what, you, what me... you bought. Your list. You gave me a recommendation. One of our listeners, I think it might have been an Allison, um, took the brownie challenge, and she decided Renee. that Renee, Renee took the brownie. She she liked Duncan Hines. Well, we bought Duncan Hines dark chocolate, and I made them. And I'm not sure I baked them as long as they should have gone because they were a little thin. They were tasty, but I still prefer the Pillsbury, which we made last night. Um, and Bob had me bake. We did it in a glass pan this time, which took a little longer to to bake. And Bob's the 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 master of Brownie. the yeah. He he dips it in, and he'll be like, "Okay, is it ready?" And I'm, you know, and do, you, do they get do you get a little hard around the corners? Yes, yes, it, and, like and that's perfect. And they chewy. came out fantastic. So 
And then our producer, Matt, sent us a video that someone did where they looked at, I think, 10 different uh, right. box brownies, and they their king kingpin was Ghirardelli. By the way, I've tried the Ghirardelli Which brownie Which I was surprised mixer. about. And it's like three times as much as the Pillsbury one. Seven, six to $7 a box yeah. versus Pillsbury is on sale for $1.82. How do I know it? Because I just bought two bucks. <laughs> I got to do the Pillsbury thing. I was at the store the other day, and I laughed because I saw the you Duncan Hines oil. and Betty Crocker. But I didn't see the Pillsbury one, so I've I've got yeah, to hunt you, down the Pillsbury and get the dark one. chocolate. It's 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 scrumptious. Yeah. The one thing so I want to try, go. and I said this to Renee because she had said she and her daughter, after they listened to the show, they did the they did the test and they came up with Dunkin' Donuts. Her daughter Mary Duncan Francis, Hines. Or, I'm sorry, Duncan Hines, Mary Francis. And I said to her, I I had seen when I was looking for this orange cake. <gasps> you mentioned this, yeah. Which I've never I've never had. Now I did try to make an orange key lime pie, which was or an orange lime pie, uh, orange pie, which was a disaster. I don't think that, yeah. Well, somebody told me too much water in oranges. So that's why I didn't oh, say. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't that realize makes that. Sense. So that's why and I didn't say. You made pudding. I made pudding. But the, um, I, so I was thinking about trying this orange cake thing, whether it's Betty Crocker or Duncan Hines or one of those to see if orange cake. I, have you ever, I haven't had orange cake in forever. I Neither have I. You, no, yeah. I'm not even sure I ha- can tell lemon. you the last time I ever had it was. Yeah. Yeah. A long, long time ago. So anyway, try the six and one challenge. Maybe we'll uh, I'll post it to our social media so you can see what the uh, the recipe list is in terms of the six to one uh, ratio in terms of your shopping. And uh, thanks for joining us here today on uh, the Focus Group. We appreciate the time you spend with us. Be sure to learn all about us at focusgroupradio.com. While you're there, you'll also see links to our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, which is released every Tuesday. You'll also find our sponsors there, including Deep Discount. And right now there's a Shark Madness sale going on, site-wide sale. I picked Best in Show. John picked a great older film, Scarlet Street. And the new release this week is The Color Purple. So be sure to, uh, again, head over and support our friends at Deep Discount. We want to remind everybody that uh, we want you to arrive alive. So don't text and drive. Too many people are doing that and you hear about too many accidents. And uh, we want you to be safe out there. And we'll see you next time on The Focus Group. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.